Hello, my name is Daniel Lescano. I'm working for the Canal Working Room for in Linaro. Um, so I wanted to do some uh, update on the thermal framework because the reason is um, the thermal framework is gaining more and more importance uh, because it's one of the major factor limiting the performances on the SOC. And on the other side, we have uh, some issue with the maintenance chip, which is uh, unresponsive. And finally, in the current maintainer just bail out and uh, the patch patches were not merged uh, in time. So that was delaying the features and, and so So for drivers, it could be a problem. But the, uh, in particular, the, the main issue is the thermal core itself. Um, also, we want to talk about different aspects of the thermal framework we can improve. And then uh, there were some changes recently. We need to present what, what are the new features for this framework. And then uh, I will end up by um, giving some information about the future work of the thermal framework. So now there is a new, the maintainer chip problem is solved. Uh, there is two new maintainer and reviewer. So one new maintainer, me, and, um, and Amit Kucheria, uh, who is also involved in reviewing the patches. Uh, so we have more higher looking at the code and, um, and doing feedbacks. Before we had two trees, the Thermasoc tree and the uh, Telma core tree with the Intel. So then it was a bit confusing because we didn't know to which tree, against which we should provide patches and uh, which maintenance should take them. So we created a group, which is the Thermal group. And we have a single tree. Um, so any maintainer of the Thermal, so it could be Zangui or it can, could be me, can commit patches on this tree. We have three branches. We have a kernel CI branch. So this branch can be rebased. So when I pick a patch, I put this patch on this branch. If everything is all right, it goes to the Linux X branch. And when it's all right, it goes to the next branch. The next branch is never rebased. Um, and the Linux next branch and the kernel CI branch can be rebased. Also to comply with the, the um, upstreaming process, we are using now sign up tags. So we put a tag and we sign that. And finally, for each patches we merge, we take the patch and we put um, the description, well, a link to LKML giving the, the, you can have access to the full thread for these patches. And it's given in the, this in this form. So, so you have a link with the the message, the, the URL um, to the to this patch. So we did on the thermal framework some cleanups. First of all, the enable and disable thermal zone was not very well handled. So we fixed that, and it resulted in some code cleanup and removal of some callbacks, a new callback, so that um, reduced the complexity of the code. Um, also, we remove, we remove the clock cooling device because it was in use uh, anywhere, maybe by out of tree kernel, but we don't care, they're not um, uh, upstream, so we remove them. We remove uh, all um, pointless stuff we have because the main, one of the main problem of the thermal framework is exporting the entire earth to all the all the different drivers. And all these drivers are changing the internals of the thermal framework because they have direct access to the structure and so on. So we improve the situation because it's, a, it's a, an obstacle for us to do improvement in the thermal framework as every driver are doing some crappy things with the internals. So we have to do some cleanups around that. Also, we changed the governors, um, the way they are initialized, and now they are initialized automatically and they are registered uh, sooner. 
And there is a plan to rework the locks on the framework because there, they are on using the mutex. Mutex is a heavy lock. And they are taken for every changes in thermal framework. So we suspect we can solve that with uh, spin locks and ref counting. One new feature we have is the new cooling, a new cooling device. So in some, today we have uh, the CPU frag DVFS, DVFS changes, cooling device based. And um, we can have a situation where the DVFS is not available and you need another cooling device to make sure that you will cap the, the, you cap the performances of the system uh, in order to prevent this temperature to go higher and higher and higher. So that happens when there is no DVFS or if the voltage domain is shared with uh, another device. So when the other device is in use and is this voltage, then you cannot undervolt with a DVFS and it results on having this temperature increasing. So some boards are, not, are just not working because of that. And they, they, when they go in, in a long term, in a long run, uh, with heavy load, then they, they, they end up by rebooting because they reach this critical temperature. Now we provide something in order to fill this hole we have where we don't have any solution to cool down the device. So now with the idle injection, we can cool down the device. And the advantage of this cooling device is you the DT is very flexible. So you can set um, this cooling device for one CPU, for two CPU, for um, um, all the CPUs. Uh, you can specify the latency. So the, the idle state selection to do the idle injection will be, uh, will be influenced by this latency. So it will, won't be choosing uh, an idle state which is too deep. Also, you can choose the duration of the sleep time. So of course, it makes more sense to put a duration, which is at least twice the duration, uh, the target residency. Um, thanks to this device, the temperature in, in terms of uh, mitigation is much more stable. So you, when you reach, you have a flat curve instead of having this uh, uh, so teeth we can find with the DVFS. But the drawback, it, they, it introduces a latency on the system when you, you mitigate. So you have to be aware of that. It saved, it saved your system for the, for, from hard reboot, but it does, not, it does not ensure that you have full performances. It just ensures you don't go through all the specific temperature. So it, in, it introduces latency when mitigating. Also, we had today the solution to receive events from, uh, uh, from um, the kernel space to user space is not existing except if you create a user space governor. That means you will receive all the events, all the temperature, but you have to mitigate the, the temperature yourself. So it's a choice or you receive the events, but you have to mitigate the temperature. There is no longer in kernel uh, logic involved or you let the kernel handle that, but you don't receive any event. That is very um, problematic for systems using user space daemon doing dynamic temperature pole management. So they need this information receiving without um, having to deal with the mitigation they need to get to get the the temperature to get the the the, the threshold being crossed, the way they are crossed, and so on. So for that, there is a Netlink framework. Uh, the user space code is available somewhere, but uh, it's another aspect. We have to merge that with the lib libnl. Um, we have three channels. The first one is to disco to send discovery commands. The second one 
if you are not interested in increasing any temperature, you can receive event channel just telling you the events happening on thermal framework. Or if you are just interested in the temperature, you can have just sampling channel and you receive the temperature. If you are not interested, if you are interested in both, you just subscribe to both channels and you receive both information. There is um, a detailed description of this, um, what are providing the netlinks on the, on the blog. Uh, you can find the thermal notification with netlink blog. There is all the, the definition and the semantic of uh, each messages. Also, um, there, are, there were some changes in the energy model because um, we have the energy model, but the, the different diff cooling devices were not using this energy model to change the performance state. They were, they were doing the same thing as the energy model. So instead of duplicating the code, uh, the energy model has been um, merged, well, reused in the separate free cooling device. That sends up, we end up to, to provide some changes. So we have the energy model, which is now in the stroke device. So we can tie the energy model structure uh, life cycle with the stroke device life cycle. So it's much cleaner instead of duplicating ref counting and so on. And thanks to that, we have potentially the possibility to, uh, to provide an energy model per device. And now the next step happening right now is um, the same thing. So using DEFREC and SEPERFREC cooling, uh, cooling code to, co to be consolidated using the energy model. And as there, there are a lot of common things between these two cooling devices, it makes sense to merge somehow uh, part of the code. So the thermal framework is preventing the temperature to go above a certain limit, but it does not prevent to go below. And for some devices, which are, uh, which are outdoor devices, when they are functioning during the night, the temperature can decrease and then they, they need to be warm up. They need, a, they need a warm up in order to, to have the silicon still functioning. So here we have a silicon which is functioning below a too high temperature and above a too cold temperature. So it's introducing, we need to introduce this temperature range thing. And for that, we have um, devices which are increasing their performance state to warm up, to eat. The, the system. And well, actually, um, intuitively, we think that it's a the mirror. So we think that it's just a question of <laughs> inverting, doing using negative value instead of positive value and doing the a split, which is semantically correct. But from a term of an implementation point of view, that is false, because we have uh, the QS constraint putting mean and max values and that change. So we need different constraints. Also, we have the different instances of the cooling devices and warming devices. So we can have one cooling device or one warming device on top of two thermal zones. They can be shared across. So there is uh, an aggregation of, um, there is an aggregation of the, the states and for that, it's not so easy to do just the opposite with the warming device. So it's still under discussion. And uh, well, we had um, a long discussion at LPC. We agree with the concept of warming the devices, but now it's a question about uh, discussing about the implementation. From the hierarchical thermal zone point of view, Last time we presented that, there were not a very big uh, enthusiasm for this feature. And um, but we had to think about a bit more about that. So finally, we came back with a proposal to use the power cap framework with the energy model. So actually, we think that instead of uh, having the thermal framework to collaborate, which does not really make sense because we need uh, to, have to cap 
the, the to make sure that the, the device, the thermazone, is not going above the temperature, we don't have uh, this concept of uh, having an intermediate temperature. So the power limiting framework, power cap framework, is much more adequate to do that. So what we want to do is to export an API to have all the um, devices providing the different callbacks through this API to set power limit. Then user space, which is the most, uh, is the component most aware of how the stock behave, can take different power limitation action on this, on this tree, depending on the load and depending on the, the kind of pattern is detecting on the system. Of course, as we can change the power, that goes somehow we can find that the, in the intelligent power, um, power allocator can use this framework somehow. So, so we, we will see how that can fit with the entire uh, power cap thing, if it makes sense or not. Okay, I finished the presentation. Thank you. If you have any question, uh, any question, please feel free.